many of the struggles of humankind center around finding a happy accommodation between the claims of the individual and the cultural claims of the group. The fate of humanity may rest upon whether such an accommodation can be reached. In this regard, the ambiguous relationship of romantic love to civilization is illustrative. On the one hand, it often comes into opposition with civilization's broader interests. On the other, civilization threatens love with substantial restrictions. The human discovery that this type of love affords us the strongest experiences of satisfaction and even provides a prototype of complete happiness leads us to believe we should make its fulfillment the central point of our existence. Although sages of every era have warned us most emphatically against this way of life, it has not lost its attraction. Sigmund Freud, Civilization and Its Discontents. Based on an early German retelling of the 12th century Celtic legend about doomed lovers, Richard Wagner's music drama Tristan und Isolde was largely inspired by his introduction to the writings of the German philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer. Schopenhauer's philosophy of enlightened pessimism so thoroughly permeates this work that a deep understanding of the opera is difficult to attain without at least a passing knowledge of the philosopher's principal ideas. As a young man, Schopenhauer was preoccupied with the problem of suffering, which he saw as clear evidence of the absence of an all-loving God. He became attracted to Buddhism, which in its Four Noble Truths defines suffering as inescapable, identifies desire and illusion as its sources, declares that suffering can be transcended and lays out a path towards achieving that goal. These concepts decisively inform Schopenhauer's most important work, The World as Will and Representation. In this book, Schopenhauer identified what he called the Wille zum Leben, the will to life, or more simply, the will, a complex of natural drives that insistently impel us to act upon our most primitive desires. The will exists in a state of radical independence from the intellect and is indifferent to reason or morals. This essential force can only be quelled temporarily. It reemerges continually in many forms. Its primary expression is in the realm of sexual desire, motivated by the imperatives of reproduction and the continuation of the species. Further, the state of mental intoxication provoked by lust is, in Schopenhauer's view, an inherent necessity. If sex was approached with a mindset disposed to consider the many sacrifices attendant to raising a child and sustaining a long-term relationship with a partner, reproduction might be greatly inhibited. To mitigate the suffering caused by our desires, Schopenhauer offered two possibilities. We can adopt the traditional path of sages by acknowledging our primitive drives and engaging in practices and modes of living that instill the discipline necessary to transcend these impulses. Knowing that few would choose such an ascetic existence, Schopenhauer also extolled the therapeutic value of art, which brings us into contact with the will to life, yet allows us to discharge its potentially self-destructive energy within a benign context. Among the arts, he considered music to be the most authentic reflection of the will, and thus the most powerful. In his words, music is as immediate an objectification and copy of the will as is the world itself. Wagner first read Schopenhauer's massive work in 1854, when he was living in Switzerland and crafting a new way forward after a long period of professional and personal tumult. Schopenhauer's thinking immediately filled him with a sense of validation. In a letter to Matilda Weisendonck, the wife of a wealthy patron whose liaison with Wagner also fueled the composition of Tristan und Isolde, the composer wrote, A unique sense of self-renewal overcomes me each time I open that book. I am whole once more and see myself fully understood and clearly expressed. It transforms my suffering into an object of understanding and reveals the whole world to me. Although Wagner dismissed Schopenhauer's suggestion of an ascetic lifestyle out of hand, the philosopher's implicit affirmation of the romantic ethos, which rejected the rationalism of the Enlightenment in favor of an emphasis on emotions and the subterranean elements of the psyche, resonated with Wagner deeply and the societal importance Schopenhauer ascribed to composers provided considerable ballast for his heroic self-image.
Inspired by Schopenhauer's worldview and his discovery of Gottfried von Strasberg's account of Tristan and Isolde's disastrous, all-consuming love, Wagner eventually put aside the composition of his massive tetralogy, The Ring of the Nibelungen, in August of 1857, and began to work on his setting of the old romantic legend in earnest. What flowed from his pen over the following two years changed the course of Western art music. Wagner's Tristan music represents both the height of musical romanticism and the beginning of its dissolution. It embodies the tragic spiritual essence of a primal love that is repeatedly thwarted by the inexorable demands of reality. From the first note, Wagner establishes an atmosphere of agonized suspension and then miraculously sustains it over a vast operatic time span with a unique combination of musical elements that includes a pervasive, tonality-obscuring level of chromaticism, frequently overlapping phrases, and deceptive cadences. Most notably, the harmonic language in this opera is often highly ambiguous, a feature that is established at the outset with the appearance of the so-called Tristan chord, a dissonant, half-diminished seventh chord in inverted form. Although this has been referred to as the most famous chord in music, what makes it exceptional is its relationship to the chord that follows. In traditional harmony, a dissonance is followed by a consonance. Resolution is foundational in the tonal system. But the Tristan chord merely leads, after two intervening passing tones, to another dissonance, a so-called dominant seventh chord. Although this type of chord is such a commonplace that it might not appear particularly dissonant in itself, it is in fact a strategically placed chord of irresolution that usually functions as a transitional harmony. By implicitly rejecting the traditional concept that a dissonance is most naturally resolved, this compact harmonic formula, partly by virtue of its standing as the musical signature of one of the most powerfully evocative operas in the repertoire, became the symbolic seed for Western harmony's eventual unraveling. It wordlessly articulates Schopenhauer's belief that our most fundamental desires can never be fully satisfied in the real world. Thus, this vexing harmonic progression appears throughout Tristan und Isolde as a powerful, poignant expression of the doomed couple's dilemma, only to be resolved in the drama's final bars, as the lovers who could not be joined in life are ultimately unified in death. Mm -hmm. 